Well, everybody, welcome to uh, Formic's first uh, webinar. Uh, today, we're going to talk about palletizing. Um, and uh, I'd like to introduce our guest, Wes Garrett, Executive Director of Global Accounts at Fanic for Food and Beverage. Um, I will, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll have uh, Wes introduce himself and give you a little background on what he does. Uh, Wes, welcome. Thanks for agreeing to be our first uh, guest on our podcast webinar. Hey, thanks a lot, Misa. Um, hey, good, good afternoon and good morning to uh, those of you on the on the West Coast. Um, so I'm Wes Garrett. I'm uh, in uh, I'm with Fatic America, and in, in our uh, executive sales team. And I, I just recently started a new role as a, an executive director of global accounts. So I, I focus on primarily food and beverage uh, markets. And um, you know my goal is to really just help help uh, manufacturers down their automation journey. Um, whether it be, you know, help out with automation audits or, um, you know, uh, an automation type roadmap, right? So how, how, how do you get from a manual operation to a fully automated facility? Awesome. Yeah. So, uh, Wes, I know you've been at Fanuc for, for a little while. Can you tell us a little bit how you got started in automation and what, what are the things that you have done throughout your career at, at Fanuc, uh, just to give the audience a little bit of history? Uh, Absolutely. So... Now, almost 20 years ago, graduated uh, from Michigan Tech University with a bachelor's in mechanical engineering. Um, from there, I went right into robotics um, at, at a small uh, robotics consulting firm where I was doing robot programming and simulation work. Um, from there, I came to FANUC uh, in the automated systems group here at headquarters where I was doing a lot of uh, powertrain systems. So machine load on load. Um, systems design, that kind of thing, simulation, tooling, all that. Um, and then from there, I went into our maternal handling segment group. So I became a product manager for the, our palletizer robots as well as software. Um, so extremely fluent with all that. And then um, I also dabbled in our, in our pick tool software, so picking and packing as well. Then um, I, I got over into the sales side of things um, where I joined the authorized system integrator group. And I was account manager, and I covered all the pick pack pal or you know packaging ASIs. Um, I'm going to say ASI probably a lot today. So ASI stands for Authorized System Integrator. Um, and so you know I worked with them, helped help to find new integrators, grow the ones that we had, and really you know just help them a little more from the technical side of things of you know how to grow their business in, in that packaging area. And then this you know just this past. Uh, month in, in january I, I moved over in the est team as we just talked about that's awesome congratulations no thanks uh thanks for that so today we want to talk about palletizing there's a lot of buzz around palletizing and there's a lot of companies are looking to automate uh uh in the line in the line packaging application um but there's too many options right if you walk a trade show you see all sorts of different palletizing solutions uh there are gantries there are the traditional uh, there's cobots there's industrial um you know, but specifically, we're seeing a lot of growth in, in robotic palletizing. What what are the, some of the advantages of robotic palletizing compared to traditional uh, like gantry palletizers? Yeah, so I think there's a few things there. Um, so number one, footprint, right? So you can really make it look however you want, um, and, and with with the varieties of, of sizes and payloads of robots that we have, um, we can usually get something shoehorned in there if you have got a really tight space. And flexibility, right? Um, you know, robots and flexibility just go hand in hand. Um, whether you want it to palletize today or you want it to, to pick and pack tomorrow, that same robot can, can probably do that. Um, and then, you know, the, uh, as far as tooling goes as well, so, so maybe you're palletizing a small box today and tomorrow you want to do a large box, you know, we just change the tool, right? So you swap the tool out and now you can easily switch or you can, you know, dynamically switch from, from batch to batch uh, with a tool changer. And then, you know, repurposability. So, you know, we've got people all the time that call us up and it's, we're 12, 15 years down the road. They've got this robot in, in their production and, and it's, well, we wanna move it over here and, and, and reallocate it to another palletizing area. And that's great. Um, so you, know, you can really use these things as long as you want and, and, and always update, you know, update the tooling, update the layout, whatever you may need to suit your purposes. Um, and then reliability, right? So if you know anything about, you know, mechanical things, the, the more mechanical items you have, the greater 
um, possibility of a failure, right? So the more things you're going to have, the higher failure rate. With, with our robots, you've got four to six axes of, um, of, of joints, right? So typically the palletizers are only four. So you got four RVs and, and four reducers. That's really all that's going on. Where when you when you've got a conventional machine, you've got a lot more um, axes, you know, and, and, and motion points than that to, to make those systems work. So you know, the reliability is going to go way up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of moving pieces in the traditional layer palettes and gantry palettes. So there's more points of failure, if you will, compared to robotics. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. What are the, are there any disadvantages of you know choosing an industrial robot palletizer versus versus gantry, if if there is any, like at all, like that you've come across? Right. I mean, there, there's not anything really, um, you know, on, on paper that's there. And the, the only hurdles that I've I've come up myself or, or just you've got you find manufacturers that you know they, they, they bought a they had a conventional palletizer and then you know 30 years ago and they just they, they've not gone into robotic palletizing they've, they've either not heard of it or not thought about it um they don't have that comfort level with it they you know they think that it might be you know the technology might be too advanced or something of that nature and you know just let us help you get over that curve right you know, just let us yeah. walk you through um, you know, the training needed and, and, and really what the, the ease of use that we have are with the robot. No, that makes sense. It, so there's a lot of people on the fence in getting started with, you know, automation and, and you know, palletizing specifically. What are the what are the ways the manufacturer could decide whether or not they should keep the process that they have manual or they should kind of really consider, heavily consider start using automated palletizing? What are kind of the checklist things that they should consider? Absolutely. So the first thing is, is, can you actually find that person, right? Do you have that person that's showing up to work every day? They're willing to do your palletizing for you. You know, it's it's very few and far between for me to walk into a manufacturer and, and have someone say that, you know, that labor is not an issue. Uh, in today's age, I think we all know that it, it is very difficult to find that labor. So if, if you can't find the labor, we really need to start looking at that. And then, um, you know, our you get work injuries, right? You know, palletizing is is a very laborious task. Um, you know, typically you're going to be palletizing from the floor, you know, up to six, seven feet high. If you don't have a scissor lift for that pallet, um, and that, that's just going to cause a lot of strains, right? You're going to have, you know, some people got 30, 40 pound cases out there, and all those those work losses are, are very costly, right? Um, and then you have space for a palletizer. Um, and we talked about before, you know, some of the, the flexibility and, and, and all that kind of thing that we have. You know, I, I have seen some areas where the, it, it, is ha it has been very difficult um, to get to get palletizers in there. But, you know, if, if you um, can, can come up with uh, reasonable answers to all that, I think you can be a good way to, to start figuring out whether uh, manual or robotics is the way to go. Yeah. How about uh, the mixed like uh, number of SKUs that they have? Because there's a lot of we work with a lot of contract manufacturers that they have a lot of different, different cases, things that they got to automate. Is there like a cutoff that if you have too many, if you have too much changeover, or if you have too many SKUs, maybe it doesn't make sense for you to automate? Is there is there like a rule of thumb there that you, you would you would look for? Not necessarily. Um, you know, with the software that we have nowadays. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's simple for a system integrator. It's also simple for an end user and a manufacturer, if you want to take that onus on yourself, to simply enter in a length, width, and height of a case um, and, and enter a payload in there. And the software does the rest. So, you know, typically 20 loads is, is very straightforward and, and, and pretty quick to set up, but I've got customers with a thousand loads. Um, and that, doesn't mean that we don't do you know robotic automation. It just means that you know you've got to spend a little more time getting all those you know established. And typically on day one you don't need a thousand loads. Day one you might need fifty, right? And so you can build them as you go. Um, so I would not let that be a hurdle to how many loads you have. I'd just make sure that you choose a, a partner with a good um, user interface and and uh, and, and palletizing software to, uh, to to allow you to continue to grow with your system. Makes sense. No, thanks. You know, um, we hear always uh, great stories about automation, but there's always some scenarios where automation don't go as planned. Um, like, can you think of any of those types of examples and what are the things that manufacturers should kind of look ahead of time to avoid some of those, you know, failures so to make sure that their automation, uh, you know, really works out the way that they anticipated? 
So unfortunately, this does happen. And I, and I think that the underlying cause usually is, is communication. Um, you know, so end users, manufacturers, they're, 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 just, they're excited. They're, they they want to get a robotic solution. They want to get their automation in there and then get started, get the ROI the clock going, all that. Um, but if you haven't done this a lot or maybe not at all, um, where do you start, right? Where, how, how do you write that RFQ? And so, you know, I find a lot of manufacturers aren't even writing an RFQ or if they do, it's, you know, it's two pages long. So if it, an integrator doesn't understand your requirements, it's going to be very difficult to give them the solution that, that you want, right? Um, so, you know, such things as, you know, what are your throughput requirements? Do you have a burst rate? Um, you know, these things can cause havoc on an actual system. You know, product, product sizes and weights, I've had, you know, some manufacturers just, they, not, they don't list them all, right? So then we get to the final line and, well, we have this one and this one, how about that? And, and all of a sudden, maybe you have a box that was too big that, you know, wasn't accounted for and the tooling won't work, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, you have pallets or slip sheets. Um, and what are the conditions of them? You know, I've seen, you know, some manufacturers where their, their pallets are just chewed up. And, and, you know, and that can be really difficult to handle those. Yeah. And, and then there's, you know, like environmental conditions as well. Um, you know, are, are you, you know, going to have, be next to a room with where there's, you know, some caustic chemicals or something going on where that, you know, that, that vapor is going to leach in and, you know, and cause issue with the equipment, um, all those types of things. So I guess my advice is, you know, make sure that your RFQ is, is well you know, put together and uh, you'll absolutely avoid all these project issues. Makes sense. Speaking of writing RFQs, there's a lot of specific information that required to, to write a good RFQ. What are some must-have information that people could kind of think about when they're writing these RFQs? Is there like a set of must-have checklists that people need, should, should go through? Yeah, yeah. So things like the rates, you know, sizes of all your products, you know, length, width, and heights, um, the weights. You know, believe it or not, you, we, we need to know what those weights are. That way we can size the robot properly. Um, the load height. So, what, what is the max load height? Um, you know, the taller load you got, you know, the larger uh, the envelope we're going to need on a robot to, to do that. Um, and then your patterns, right? So, what are those patterns? Those patterns sometimes can play into the rates, right? So, if it's a real challenging pattern, it may take longer to palletize that. So, we want to know what that is up front to, to uh, calculate for all that. And then space, right? Uh, we don't want to be able to we don't design a system that won't fit in the space that you have. So if you can define those things, I think that uh, you'll be in really good shape to, to get these things kicked off. Makes sense. Um, you know, another area that, you know, people kind of are, are, are concerned when it comes to, you know, deploying automation is like safety risk assessment and, just, you know, safety consideration that goes around deploying machines. How should manufacturers kind of, you know, think about you know, going through the processes to make sure that the system they're deploying is safe, and furthermore, whose responsibility is to figure out whether the system is safe or not? Is the manufacturer of the equipment? Is it the end user that is using the machine? What, what is what is kind of the safety landscape look like for deploying industrial palletizers? Yeah, for sure. So I think there's a number of things to look at, um, and and absolutely, safety is 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 a thing that you you want to start looking at from day one. Um, you know, for, so so one thing is, is there enough real estate? The more real estate you have, the easier it is to make your solution safe, right? So you can put the proper guarding in. You can have plenty of uh, room for your light curtains in, in that, you know, that approach space that you would need. Now, when we start to get into a tighter area, now we've got to look at other um, scenarios, right? So what type of things can we utilize to, um, to improve that? So, you know, area scanners, light curtains, um, safety mats, these types of things. How do we implement those to be sure that an operator is safe? And so you think about, you're bringing in operators, you know, some people are bringing them in weekly, right? Um, they just can't hang out. So you don't have time to, you know, spend a week in training, right? You, you've, you've got to give them, you know, whatever, a few hours of uh, safety training. They watch a safety video and then send them out there. Um, so you really got to make sure that somebody with minimal safety um, knowledge uh, is going to be able to go out there and, and not get hurt, right? Um, so you have to identify all the possible risks that are going on. And this starts with a, a safety risk assessment. And those safety risk assessments are a, a full collaboration between the manufacturer and the system integrator. So those should start very early in the project phases 
and and then end you know prior to you know you're, you're shipping that system so both parties are in full agreement that you've defined all the risks at hand and then you've mitigated all the risks that you need to mitigate um, and that's really the best way to go about it yeah, no, it makes sense. So one of the areas that I'm seeing quite a bit, um, sometimes manufacturers don't have a ton of space. So there's a couple of major ways that you could do, you know, fully safe cells. And oftentimes the easiest one is you guard the entire cell, lock out, tag out. But I'm seeing more and more of just, you know, because of lack of footprint, people just putting, uh, 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 you know, safety area scanners, maybe like a, a four side safety scanner. Like, what are your thoughts around that? Like, are you seeing more and more of those types of deployment, or are you still seeing a bulk majority of companies just guarding the entire cell? I think ultimately, the, the, the greatest demand, or I guess the, I'll say the demand, but the, the, the greatest um, case that, you know, the, the, the product that is getting sold is, is primarily going to be guarded. There's mm -hmm. just a lot of advantages to it. Um, you know, you can still get a really tight space with guarding. Um, so we have our safety software called DCS, which is dual check safety, allows you to bring those envelopes in. So essentially create virtual envelopes and get that robot into really confined spaces. We've got, you know, uh, partners with, with palletizers that are as small as eight by 10 foot in, in footprint, um, which is a very tight area. So when you get into, you know, more of the, what we would call a fenceless solution where we're going to use these area scanners, um, yes, we can drop the barriers. But now we have a, a, a new hurdle, which is your um, stop stop distance, right? So from the time that those area scanners see an operator coming in, and you know, the operator's going to be walking in a certain clip, we have to be able to slow that robot down and then you know bring it to a complete stop. You know, if it's in, in some cases, or we're going to get it down to a slow speed for a collaborative robot um, before that person gets there. So those safety cushions um, can get large. Um, and they can be larger than that eight by ten footprint of, um, of of your small palletizing cell. The other thing to consider is, and maybe it's not people, but if, if you're sitting in an aisle, right? And, and many of your palletizers are on an aisle because they're right at the end of the line. They're on that aisle to get picked up from a fork truck. Um, and so, if you have fork truck traffic, or just you know human traffic, or HEV or AMR traffic. If these things are, are cruising by, they can trip those those scanners and then either slow or even stop the robot down. And so now your your throughput is getting thrown out the window. So you really have to look at each you know scenario, each application, each opportunity that you have, and then assess that properly. Oh, that makes sense. Another area is seeing you know uh, sometimes people do uh, you know eliminate the, the 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 hard guarding and they put safety scanners, but then you know like you said they have new operators walking the line. The robot slows down. Now you have like a bunch of boxes that are accumulating, and because the robot is not hitting rate, so there's all those you know gotchas uh, that happen when you don't use guarding. But yes, I have seen a lot of these new palletizers getting like tighter, tighter in footprint, new designs. So you know if, if you know I guess the short answer is if if people People really want to be to be sure that the system is safe. Let's always look at like you know figuring out a tighter tighter tight, tighter footprint palletizer, but guarding around it. Absolutely. So uh, I think one of the areas is you know I think you could ask ten different accountants on how to calculate an ROI for a true palletizing machine. You get like probably twenty different answer. As a, a palletizing expert and somebody that's seen a ton of deployments, what is the most common way to calculate an ROI for a palletizing machine? Yeah. So. What there, you know, I think there's there's two there's two um, sides of this coin, and there, there's one where you've got the manufacturer, and then there's the other where you've got a system integrator, or myself, a, a, a robot guy, and and we, we've got different different thoughts, right? And so the manufacturer, you know, typically off the cuff, straightforward is you know what's my fully bur full full burden rate of, of an operator, and we just take that and we multiply that by you know the number of shifts that you have running. And, and that's where you're gonna you want to. That's your your baseline of where you least want to land with it. Um, you know, of course, there's some other, some other factors that come in there, but that they're really hard to quantify. And so, things that we also like to look at is, you know, work loss cases. Are you having them? You know, what do those actually cost you? How do you how do you apply those to your ROI? And then attrition rates. Um, you know, constantly having to get new um, workers in there, and it's not just you know. We'll get the next guy in line. It's there, typically there. There's some some training involved, right? 
Um, sure. You've got to show them how to, to, to stack that pallet, whatever. There's, there's a cost associated with that, right? Finding the person, training the person, um, you know, benefits, whatever else you're going to have rolled into there. All these things have to stop and start, and, and there's absolutely that that has to be uh, calculated. And then, you know, operators just not showing up at all. Showing up not, at all or showing up late. If they're not showing up, then your line's not running. Um, and so, you know, what is that, that opportunity cost of that? Um, especially, yeah. you know, during uh, this whole pandemic, many people have just been, you know, I've, I've seen uh, manufacturers as high as hundreds of, of, of people short. Um, and so they, they have to either slow their whole line down or, you know, just not run certain lines that day. And we, you know, we go in the grocery store and you know, we, we see, you know, spots on shelves where they're just empty. You know? That's because they didn't run that line. And, and you know, today they don't have that product. Um, and so if you don't run the line and you don't have the product, that's, that's, that's product, uh, that, that's revenue loss, right? Um, yeah. So we have to look at, so if we did put the automation in there, what, what additional gains do you get from being able to run that product? So all these things have to be um, looked at, and, and I think that they have been getting looked at much much closer lately. And and those ROI values, you know, you know, typically, traditionally, you know, two years is kind of the bogey of many manufacturers look at, and maybe, maybe some as short as 18 months, but then some would want to even look, um, would, would look at longer ones. And so now we're starting to see people starting to look at those, you know, two and a half to three year paybacks, and, um, you know, can we make that make sense, especially figuring in some of these other factors? Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, you brought a really good point. I think one, one thing that I haven't seen many manufacturers really consider sometimes is the lost production, right? There's 8,000 some odd hours throughout the year, and most of the factories in America run probably, you know, three, four, five thousand 5,000 at most. So well, how much incremental value can you gain by, by keeping these lines constantly running, which is something that I'm surprised that manufacturers don't look at like that deeply, and they just look at like a one-on-one -on -one replacement with being labor. Uh, and, and rightfully so, because sometimes, especially the newer manufacturers who don't have any automation, they don't really know the value of running the line without any, any people on it at all. And once they kind of see it, those numbers start kind of uh, you know circling in their head that hey maybe we should think about you know getting more business and running these lines almost 24 7 because now we don't have to manage the labor that's a really good point uh, so on that note are you seeing you know, any specific industry that is that is just really expediting and deploying an automation you know palletizing specifically is there any sub segment of the industry that you're seeing a lot of growth in it yeah for sure um... You know, so historically, you know, looking at palletizing in general, you know, we've we've seen a lot of great um, growth and maturity come out of the food and bev and even you know the CPG industries. But then, if we if we really kind of narrow down into um, you know th those areas are kind of broad. So if we start looking at like uh, bakery and uh, protein areas as well as logistics, fulfillment, those types of things. We're seeing lots of growth just because historically they haven't had a lot of automation there. Um, you know, it's always labor has been king there. Um, you know, the, their, their products are typically, you know, lower margin, um, higher rates, and, and they're just they're, they're putting them out with the getting them people historically. But as, as we've gone through this pandemic, a lot of people have left the labor force and they just still have not come back. And um, yeah. So those areas have, have really come to the plate much faster. Um, and, and while the others are still automating, but we're seeing higher growth in those in those other uh, markets. Yeah, interesting, that makes sense. So, uh, you know, when you're thinking about as a manufacturer and a new, an user, you're trying to, all right, like now it's time to automate, you know, I have labor problems, I really need to keep the lines running more often than I am. Uh, one of the questions that people try to like ask is like, how how do you even choose the right vendor? Because if you look, if you're in the market for a palletizer, and you go to Pack Expo, and then you'll see hundreds and hundreds of different options, different solution providers. What are the questions and the checklist that you should go through as an end user to choose the right partner for 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 the solution that you're looking to to get? That that's a great that's a great thought there, a great point. Um, you know, it's and whether you're at Pack Expo or you're you're Googling. It's not as easy as trying to go, you know, try to find a car, right? Yeah. Um, you know, there, there's a finite number of car manufacturers um, where there's there's almost infinite number of, of integrators out there um, nowadays. So, you know, some things to consider there, you know, some geographic proximity. So maybe you're brand new um, 
to automation to robotic automation right and and you're you're not confident that it, you you want to have something you know some peace of mind there so you want to get somebody a couple a couple hours down the street right um so that if you do run into issues you can give them a quick call hey can you just stop in here and, and, and help us out with this that could be a great thing to uh, consider then there's uh industry knowledge so does does your integrator understand your industry what you know the product you're making and and what you're trying to do um just having that you know somebody that you know maybe you're in bakery maybe you're in protein somebody that has worked in that industry before and just gets it right um, and then there's process expertise. So, you know, today we're talking about palletizing. So you're looking for a palletizer. You want to find an integrator that has built a few palletizers, right? Um, you, don't, you don't want it to be their first palletizer. You'd be their guinea pig on that. Yeah. And then uh, we've got, uh, you know, support and infrastructure. So, you know, you want to definitely check out their bench strength and see, you know, who, who is available to come out and support you, right? You buy the system, um, you know, obviously Fanta can, it's going to support their, that robot, but you know, nine times out of ten, it's it's more of a system solution. It, you know, it's, it's a gripper, it's a dress out, it's you know, you've got conveyance, all these other pieces. Um, so you want to make sure that there's somebody that is going to be able to come out and assist at, at, a, at a good in a good uh, um, time frame. And then, um, you know, are they, are they mature or emerging? You know, so for palletizing, there's plenty of mature integrators out there to to go with. But maybe you're looking at more of an advanced uh, application, and and these advanced applications, there's there's much fewer. So so we might have to look at more of an emerging um, partner at that point, and that's fine. Um, I, th I think you just got to vet them out properly, and and you know, if you need to get that application done, you, you got to start somewhere. And then there's culture management, right? So we've got integrators that are you know enormous, you know, you know billion dollar type companies. Um, where you're going to work with more of a project manager, right? And then we've got integrators where, you know, they're, they're still family owned. And, and maybe you want to have that, you know, that more personal experience where you sit down and talk with the owner of the company in, in one of your, you know, meetings or in that, some of that nature. So there, there's, a, there's a big spectrum of how that works and, and looks. So, you know, keep that in mind. And then there's always budget, right? So everybody always wants, you know, a good price, a good value. Um, you know, that, that will also be a, a, a driver as well. Lead times, um, you know, lead times can really be, you know, all over the map nowadays. You know, we've got, you know, larger, good integrators that have great backlogs, you know, this, and some of them are seeing, you know, into over a year of, of backlog. Um, so, you know, consider, you know, how fast you want to start automation. And, and most people want to start sooner and later. But, um, you know, if, if, if somebody's telling you it, it maybe a year, maybe you want to look for somebody that it could do a little better than that. Um, and then there's capacity. Um, to, if you're looking for a single, you know, one-off palletizer, that shouldn't be a big deal. You know, anybody really can get that. But maybe you're looking for 50 of them, right? So if you're looking for 50, you're going to have to look for somebody that can scale, right? Some, somebody can, can handle it. You don't, you don't want to get 50 over the next 10 years. You probably want to get 50 over the next two years. So... So who can who could handle that kind of um, that 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 scalability? Yeah. And then no, um, finally, you know, service and support, and uh, you know, for, for 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 the life of the product. So you know, with Fanuc, we offer um, service and support for the life of the product. Yeah, makes sense. So you know what. Typically, when it comes to service and support, what do you typically see in the market, like for warranty? Because yes, robot is only one piece of it. You know, Fanta covers you know the spare parts and, and all that for year one. But what do you typically see as kind of a limited warranty for the for the machines that people are getting? Is it one year, six month, eighteen month? What should people expect? I think at minimum a, a one year. Um, so the way we do our warranties is um, when when integrators purchase the robots through us. They, they get a final one year at their customer. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think there's some, uh, some some integrators will offer, you know, two, maybe even three year, and, and maybe there's some additional charge for that. Um, you know, we can also offer additional uh, warranty as well. Um, but yeah, I, I would think, you know, to look at definitely for, to get that one year for sure. And then, you know, sure. if, if there's anything above and beyond that, I think that's great. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah, I think, you know, I want to highlight this point that you mentioned earlier about, like, choosing the right vendor. I think one of the things that I've seen, um, 
when you have niche applications, let's say we're talking about earlier about uh, you know freezer application, right? You know the fact that you make integrate, you make you know turnkey machine palletize it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll know how to operate in that specific environment and area. So if you whether it's a bakery, whether it's like a powdered plant, whether you're doing so, there's a lot of nuances that go into deploying palletize in different industries. So yes, like Wes said, I think it's really important to to figure out. Uh, you know whether or not the specific you know solution provider that you're looking for has done work in similar environment because a lot of nuances that you know that are, are learned and a lot of tribal knowledge that a lot of builders and integrators have accumulated over the years, which you know somebody who hasn't done and played in that space won't be able to know, which will cause the project to not to go as as uh, as planned. So yeah, that's a great point. Um, so what are the you know things you know looking back you know. Te- past 10 years to today, or maybe 15 years that you've been at, at, at FANUC, what are the, some of the advancements that have happened in the palletizing space? Like, or are we kind of same place that we were 15 years ago? Has there been any advancement in technology, whether the hardware and the software that you've seen that has made a big impact in the industry? Yeah, so I've, you know, been in the industry for 20 years. I've been able to kind of grow up with it a bit. Um, you know, so everything from ease of use, right? So being able to go up and, and grab a teach pendant nowadays and, and do the programming that the software that has evolved for ease of use is, is come, you know, light years in that, you know, the speed, not only the speed of the robot arms themselves, but, you know, the speed of the, the computation of the software, right? That, that also plays in the fact of you know, the speed of your machine. That, that absolutely has, um, has, has, has gotten better as well. <clears throat> and then, as well as the variety, you know, the number of variants that we have for today, we're, we've got over 220 variants of, of robots where, you know, 20 years ago, it would, it would you know, probably been more like 100. Um, so we're, we're developing more and more variants, you know, whether they've got, you know, food characteristics or, you know, specific palletizing um, niches, you know, they're specifically built, you know, from the ground up to palletize a case. Um, and then all, all different sizes and payloads that go along with that. So that really has, has, um, has all, all inclusive. And then and I guess the, the last thing I'll note is be the, the tooling, right? And so the more and more things that have been automated, the tooling has come a long ways. And so you start to see there's a lot more standard tooling, um, modular tooling that's available on the market to um, really do help, help you have a great solution. Yeah. No, makes sense. I think another area that I've seen quite a bit in the short term, that short time that I've been in automation in the past seven, eight years is modularization of palletizers. Like before, there was no such thing as a standard palletizer. Now people have kind of built these modules, right? Is that a the correct observation? Like if you looked at 10 years ago, 15 years ago, were there as many modularized, standardized palletizers as, as there are today? Not at all. Um, you know, pretty much everything was still... Really, I mean, it was just a one-off. I mean, they would have a lot of solutions that would be, they would consider maybe their standard design, but it wasn't really marketed as a modular solution. It wasn't, part of what makes it modular is um, typically it's a common base plate, right? So an integrator has a base that's forkliftable. Your your, um, guarding is integrated into it. So literally it's, it's a full kit on a skid. You drop it in, um, plug it in, pop the air in and, and you're done, right? And so even, you know, back then it was more of, hey, it's the same equipment, but, you know, you're bringing out a robot, a riser, all these different pieces and nailing them down to the floor. And, we, you know, we weren't taking advantage of, you know, the the, the, the quickness to um, installation, right? You know, so getting getting there installed, integrated, and um, set up and, and running production faster. So that absolutely has, has made a big difference today. So what do you think has been the main driver for builders to do this? Like, is there any push from the market or what, what do you think were some of the reasons that they decided to go on this path? Yeah, so I think there's a number of reasons. One is, is it allows um, integrators to offer something at a better value um, standpoint. So by having a pre-engineered solution and a solution that you're not going to massage much or at all, um, it's, it's cookie cutter, right? So the prints are there, they send it to the shop, and they make another one. Um, the other thing is, is lead times. So it's already engineered, so you can, again, like I said, we could just send it to the shop and, and pop the next one out. Um, and then the software comes out of the software. software's all standard software. 
all that um, kind of just gets buttoned up into it's a quick deliverable solution at a great price point, and it's you know it's it's bulletproof, it's proven, right? It's it's not a one-off uh, solution. Um, a, a ton of advantages there, and, and you know it, there's been there's no better time for us right now to have that available. So I absolutely um, would recommend you know all the manufacturers out there to take a look at try, and try to find the standards. So unfortunately, they won't fit everybody's um, application, yeah. but if you can yeah. if you can make it fit. Um, or you know maybe eighty twenty rule right you you can you know twenty percent of your systems can work with that and but the other ones are, or maybe it's eighty percent of your systems work with it um, run with that get as many of those as you can um, and then and then go after you know the cats and dogs if you will uh, to, sure. to go out with some more of these custom solutions yeah no it's a good point I think another thing that I've seen we work with a lot of partners that have these standardized modular modular solutions and what it does is really you know we, we when we talk to our customers we say look, if you just modify and get your conveyor you know, a couple of inches higher, and if you change this, that, the other, like this modular solution will fit and it could be delivered soon. So also switching the conversation from, let me build you a bespoke system to can you modify your existing line in a way that I could fit a modular system so I could deliver it faster, cheaper, better. So yeah, you're seeing a lot of that too. So back in the day, I feel like everybody was like, yeah, we'll customize to fit your need, but more and more integrators are realizing that, you know, it, it becomes really costly, it becomes a bottleneck. So, you know, they are having also a similar conversation with the customers to figure out whether ways for them to, to modify the existing lines to fit the modular solution they've already designed. So I'm happy to see, see that. Um, so, you know, looking at next 10 years or 15 years, what do you think are some of the advancements that are going to happen? What are the things that we're going to have 10, 15 years from now looking at the palletizing? What, what, are the, what, are, what, are, what does the future look like? Yeah, so I, software is going to continue to get better, right? The, the mm -hmm. idea is, is we want to have solutions that go out there where it literally it's all self-guided. You know, it, as simple as, you know, your iPad or tablet that you just literally look at, it, it's all graphical. Um, you've got icons on there and you're just gonna do drag and drop and select and, and you know, easy, simple push button go. Um, that, that's, that's, that's for sure going to uh, continue. Um, you're still gonna see some, some increases in speeds. Uh, you know, it's getting to the point where there's, there's things, you know, like physics, right? You can only move a box so fast. You, you, you can only hang on to it so good, and and uh, all these type of things kind of play into that. So it's hard to get way faster, but you know I think we'll still see maybe some some more improvements on, on that front as well. Um, and then just, just again more variety. Uh, I think that we'll at the end of the day our, the manufacturers dictate to us you know the products that they want and need, and so. As we see those, you know, those market needs change, and we pivot, and and we'll we'll build that product that you need, and and then you'll you'll have it. Another another area that I would love to kind of get your thoughts on is, you know, when, when we compare ourselves to the rest of the world when it comes to automation, specifically Japan, South Korea, uh, you know, China, there's a lot more automation per number of employees at their manufacturing facilities. What, what do you think is the reason and what can we do as an industry to just, you know, k catch up, if you will? Yeah, you know, I think that's a good question. Um, you know, so, you know, take uh, Japan and South Korea first there. You know, I, I think they've, they've always been very tech savvy uh, countries um, for, for a long time. And so they, they really have adopted that, um, that mentality of automation for quite some time. And I, I think, you know, they're, Typically, their labor has not always been, you know, low cost. So I think for those, I think that makes a lot of sense. Then, so we switch gears and go and talk about China a little bit. You know, I think you know they've always been, you know, a low cost, labor rich country. Um, you know, a lot of uh, of our manufacturing has been outsourced to China, right? Um, but now, in these last few years, um, we've started to see this reshoring effect, right? So uh, manufacturers are bringing things back to the states. Um, as they've learned here in the States that, hey, well, we can automate and we could probably do it just as good or, or better than what they could do it over there. And so, you know, labor rates have, have started to creep in China as well as, um, as, as you know, just them, them been able to produce product and be uh, a cost competitive country. So what, what are they doing, right? They're, they're doing what everyone else is doing is, is they're automating. Um, and so 
their growth in automation has actually been extremely staggering. Um, well, I guess for one, is there's a lot of manufacturers there, right? So even if every manufacturer does a little bit, it's going to show up as a lot because, um, you know, there's, there's so many of them there. Uh, so they're trying to future proof themselves, you know, to, to keep that, that um, automator, that the manufacturing there, right? Um, and then we need to do the same thing here. And so, so how do we do that? Um, well, we get, we get started, right? And so I work with a number of manufacturers um, and have found that, you know, we, we've got some that have, have, you know, not thought about it or, you know, just scratching your head thinking about it, you know, briefly and to ones that are just full blown on a bandwagon, you know, to get it done, right? And what are, what are they doing? So so what they're doing is, is you know, they're, they're documenting a plan. They're creating their own automation journey and what that looks like. So developing a roadmap, going out and do and process and automation audits. And this is where I, I spend a lot of my time um, really helping them in, in that consulting phase. So by, you have to start somewhere and that's where they want to start. And this, this whole journey, it's an, an absolute journey. It's, it's, it's not a sprint by any means. It's, it's not where you just call somebody and you get something next week. Um, you know, as we talked about earlier in this uh, chat, um, you know, all the, all the questions to ask, right? I'll, I'll, you know, then these integrators, it's a lot of shopping, right? It's not quick to just go out and find that partner right off the bat, right? Um, so there's a lot of things that you've got to kind of align and then, you know, to finally get down to the solution that you want and need. Um, so absolutely, you need to start sooner than later. Start now and, and, and get out there, you know. If you don't know where to start with that process and automation audit, reach out. Um, you know, Formic, Fanic, uh, we, we're here to help you guys. Amazing. Yeah. Um, so we might have some people who are joining the call and maybe they're students or the people who just kind of work in different careers and thinking about getting into automation. What advice do you have for, for them? Like, because one of the things that, you know, we constantly struggle a lot of the integrators that we work with, even you guys, is the labor, uh, the technical labor that we would need engineers, technicians to come and join the industry. And oftentimes there's been this connotation with manufacturing that's not safe, you know, the, the jobs might go away. What advice do you have for people who are kind of trying to dip their toes in the water and, and, and build a career around automation and manufacturing? My advice is it is a great spot to be. You know, so like, like I mentioned when we started off, I, I really come out of school. I didn't, even, I, I, at that time, I, I didn't even know how to spell robot. I, I, didn't, I didn't really know what a robot was or what they did, um, but I'm like, whatever, right? I, this sounds like fun, right? You're, you're working with uh, this articulated arm that's gonna go move things from place to place. And I just fell in love with it. Um, I, I wanna work with robots every day. Um, and so then, Robots, and then you've got automation, right? So obviously robots automate, and, and it is a great spot to be in because there's so much automation to be done. There's, there's no end in sight for, you know, even when we look at the, like the automotive industry, right? Those guys have been very well automated, automated for years, but they're still getting further down that line, um, you know, with the final assembly and whatnot. And then they constantly are changing, right? They, they, they change product platforms over four to five years. So they need a whole new line, right? So there, there's there's no end in sight for, for automation at all. So if you're looking at automation as a career, I 100% um, would, would agree to, to go chase that. It will be very fulfilling. Awesome. No, thank you. Thank you for that. Any, any final thoughts, anything that I should have asked and I didn't ask that you wanted to talk about? Yeah, I was... You know, for all those manufacturers out there, you know, just to kind of drive this home, if you haven't started that journey yet, um, there's no better time to start than now. Uh, and then, you know, as we've been talking about palletizing today. Palletizing is the best place to start. And the reason being is, is it's just low hanging fruit. It's, it's the simplest thing you really probably most likely have in your whole facility. And in order to get a good start, uh, a start where, you know, your executives are all on board, your, your stakeholders, all that kind of thing is, is, is to have a success. And you don't want to start with, you know, a, a 12 Delta solution and trying to do 1500 an hour type, you know, or 1500 a minute type of thing. 
um, and, and just be nerve wracked and, and, and freaking out about, you know, that line going down or what it's going to do, start with the palletizer, get that in there, have, have, have everyone learn how that works and, and adopt that technology and then move upstream, right? There's, there's plenty to work up to do upstream, but get those palletizers knocked out and move on upstream. Awesome. Great advice. Wes, thank you so much. This was this was great. I appreciate your time. This has been informational for me and hope the people who attend it. And uh, again, we look forward to, to working with you more. And uh, thanks again for your time, man. Hey, Misa, uh, thanks a lot for the opportunity. Uh, always, always appreciate it. Um, and uh, hey, look forward to uh, catching up with you next week at our conference. Yes, we'll see you. Thanks, Wes. Have a good one. Bye.